And we're back, Stripe Show podcast on a Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed the U.S. Open. A little different backdrop here for those watching on video. Usually you see my About Golf Simulator in the backdrop. But today you just see a bare white wall. That's because we've got a little construction going on. So bear with us here this week. Excited about the week, though. Got a great lineup starting today. A little different. Usually, you know, we kind of, little analyst form breaking down the U.S. Open. Uh, but that one just kind of, I think, wrote its own script. That was one of the better tournaments that I've seen uh, in in quite some time. The shot making down the stretch from Scheffler, Zalatoris, and, and Matthew Fitzpatrick was just incredible. That was a lot of fun to watch. And, of course, a lot of the buzz with with Fitzpatrick has been just this steady improvement that he has had in particularly um, with the driver in gaining more distance. And the guy that's helped them with that is going to join us here today, all the way up from Canada, Dr. Sasha McKenzie. I know your phone's blowing up. I know the stack system is blowing up. We're going to get to that here in a second. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to jump on the podcast today. Yeah, my pleasure, Travis. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, speed is the, it's, it's the work, right? I mean, it's just kind of the modern game. Um, when I was young, it was like, look, you know, keep it in front of you, accuracy, fairways, greens, don't three putt, and just kind of keep plotting along, right? Now it's, well, you better get some club head speed. And, and, and more important than that, <laughs> more important than that, you better get some ball speed, right? And you better get that up if you want to play uh, at the highest of level. And, and Matthew Fitzpatrick uh, bought into that. He's always been a pretty accurate player, fairways and greens. But here's a guy over the last couple of years um, that has gained a lot of distance. Set the timeline for my audience on when you met Matthew Fitzpatrick and how long you guys have been on this journey for more speed. Sure. Um, so uh, Matt's coach, uh, Mike Walker, reached out to me uh, the spring of 2020. Um, so uh, went down to the Bears Club. Um, and, and spent it, spent a day with, uh, with him and Matt. And I had a, you know, a lot of extensive conversations with Mike trying to understand Matt's game, um, where he, what his missed tendencies, what his feels were, um, that kind of thing. And then, uh, spent a lot of time, uh, talking about those things with, with Matthew, you know, like when you, things like when you, you miss a shot, um, where do you feel? Did you feel like your lower body, your hands? That kind of thing. Um, so uh, he was swinging about 112 at the time, and they realized that you know he wanted to win majors, and uh, 112 wasn't going to get it done. Um, he could compete in a lot of other tournaments, but then they would get to the Masters or a PGA, especially if it was wet, and you've got four irons and hybrids into every par four, uh, and other guys are in front of you with wedges. Um, it's just not going to not going to happen. Um, so we, we did some initial uh, stuff in mechanics that day. Um, I had uh, a lot of ideas after looking at his swing, um, paths that we could go down. And through talking with him um, and watching his swing and thinking about his feels, we slowly kind of whittled it down to, to one or two really you know, good options um, and got him swinging at 116 that day, um, mm. just through some... some uh, subtle but important mechanical changes um uh mostly using the ground a, a little more effectively in the horizontal plane which he was already really good at doing so rotating um as opposed to uh using verticals um so much um he didn't want to shift too much off the ball um or I, and i didn't think that was a good idea mm -hmm. so um he found that swing to be pretty helpful um and i set him up with a, a little plan i do uh strokes gained off the t calculation from practice shots so hit a driver go hit a seven iron hit a putt come back and hit a driver and then i run the strokes gain calculation on those 14 drivers so we can compare the new swing change with the one he's currently using um, and when it, when it got better um, in practice and it's time to put it in play and he used it a bunch that summer um, he called it the bomb um, and uh, he's pretty happy you know he could start touching 116 now and again um, but by the fall um, you know we hadn't done much communicating over the summer and by the fall he kind of fell back closer to 112 and would only pull out you know the bomb on certain holes you know so it certainly wasn't his um, go to, you know, kind of cruising swing yeah. uh, shot and played the, the masters that year was in November, wet, long, um, 
and uh, was like, well, can't comp- you know, can't really compete. And that was the sentiment of Mike. Um, so uh, made another trip down in November, and then that kind of solidified the relationship to something that was going to move on long term. Um, you know, did a little bit more mechanic stuff that day. He was pretty happy. We got back up to 116, but that's fleeting. You know, it's like, yeah, you can do it once, but are you going to put on the course? And um, I suggested that, uh, you know, we we take a, a conservative route um, because the guy was a very good player, even off the tee, top 50 strokes gained off the tee. Right. So you can quickly have someone go to a situation where they're 200th off the tee and now they're not making any money mm-hmm. um, and performing worse. So the idea was... Um, uh, let's make very gradual, subtle changes. And the best way to do that is with, um, uh, I've got an overspeed, underspeed program with the stack system. Um, we've got a great app so I can communicate with Matt through the app. I see every workout, the, the app's got my brain in it. So every workout he does, the next workout gets adjusted automatically based on how fast he's swinging certain weights. Okay. Um, and it tells you when to work out, how long to rest. Those things change dynamically. And uh, he got up to uh, eighth in, in strokes gained off the tee that June, um, which was great. He was ahead of Rory, um, which was kind of a joke when we were down there at the Bears Club. Rory was the only other person hitting on the range. Um, and it was like, yeah, it'd be great if I was driving it like that. <laughs> um, so that was great. But then, you know, um, there's a lot going on in the life of a professional golfer. A lot of parts of your game you have to attend to. And um, kind of got away from uh, the speed training over the summer. And there was a parallel kind of drop in in driving performance um uh, gave him a bit of a nudge um in, in in the fall he picked it back up uh for a few weeks four to five weeks and then won the andalusia masters um so i think that he was like okay you know th- there's a clear correlation here between my driving performance and um you know uh the the stack training um and he feels better when he's stacking he feels like he's he's hitting it straighter he's in more control so was kind of um, all right, uh, fully committed at that point, and then it's just been a steady, steady progress of one mile per hour a month, maybe flat for a month, gains three because you know playing less events, more time to work out. Um, and I should mention that is um, you know throughout this time, there's some if you're training heavy and you're playing a lot of golf, it can it can be uh, a little wearing on the body depending on how fit you are. So his trainer. Um, Matt Roberts has been great keeping him in shape, you know, a little neck tension and kind of fix that. So he's able to, uh, to do this training. Um, and yeah, so went from 112, um, and now he's kind of cruising at 119. You see shots like, um, uh, he had on hole number five, the par four. He was the only yeah. player on Sunday to drive it into the yep. wind, 181 ball speed on a rope. Um, so wow. that kind of speaks for itself. Yeah. Let's talk about the bomb. Okay, because when he calls it the bomb, you talked about the the rotational aspect of it, right? And kind of yeah. improving him there. Was it more in the backswing? Did it? It, it looks like to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. He's there, there's definitely more of this rotation going back. It seems like in the hips, maybe more of a change of knee flex, a little deeper turn, perhaps. That's lengthened things out at the top. His hands look a little bit higher. Kind of talk about the bomb a little bit and what's different there technically. Yeah, so um, just ahead of that, I will say that um, uh, just through the speed training itself um, and seeing the feedback with the radar and hitting some balls, um, there will be some, I would call them organic swing changes where you're not aware of them. And most of what you've discussed has has been that. Um, Mm. uh, I don't like golfers to have super technical feelings. I have all the technical stuff in my brain, and then I want to make sure whatever they're doing is super comfortable and maybe even not aware of it. And, and to speak to that, the um, I always come about it from, in my brain, a deterministic standpoint. We need more club head speed. And we've talked about this before on your podcast. So I don't yeah. want to lose too many of your, your viewers. Um, so I'll say this, uh, I'll just briefly say it, but um, it, there's uh, literally things that add up to club head speed. Um, and so it's not a guess, you know, like right. the, the, the force you put into the grip, the uh, path that your hands travel on, th- those things are determining your club head speed. So mechanically, I need to figure out, well, here are the things we can do to improve club head speed. Um, what's going to work for Matthew? Um, and he was very comfortable with his grip. There were some things that he just did not, he should not have changed because he felt really good and he felt like they were helping him find fairways. Mm-hmm. Um, so one thing we wanted to do was increase the force that he was putting into the grip along the hand path. He likes to play a fade, 
Um, and I saw a, a potential for him to, uh, through impact, push that lead leg a little bit more towards the target line to really apply a bit more force through impact on the handle to add some speed. Now, if you do that alone, a guy that's playing a fade, it's going to turn into uh, a slice. Mm. Um, so if, if you can, if you watch closely some of his drives, uh, some of his better drives in the weekend, you'll just see that lead foot just kind of jump back a tiny, tiny bit. Um, and, and that's been a good improvement. So that's, he's just getting a little bit more speed into the system from the ground, from that, pushing that lead foot toward the target, but you can't do that unless you change how you're transitioning. So, uh, the thought was, you know, uh, on that, uh, that day was, Hey, let's, um, I want you to transition. Like you're hitting a massive draw in doubt. So I had him hit some big draws. So the idea was, all right, I got to get the speed and that, that club, that handle going out towards the ball harder. But then he likes to hit a fade, doesn't want to hit a draw. So that's naturally going to encourage him to rip that handle back left. So now along that whole hand path, we're getting a higher average force and you get a bit of a bit of a speed jump. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I was going to say, what's interesting, what we, we just said, not to interrupt you here, but I want to bring you back to what you said about the backswing. You said a lot of that is subconscious what he's doing, right? Like, He's trying to hit it harder, but yet it, no one's telling him, hey, maybe let's get a little more loaded. Let's turn your right hip more. Let's get your hands a little higher. Let's get the club a little bit longer in the backswing. Like all these things that I'm watching, I'm like, yeah, I can see the difference in those things. Sure. In his backswing, those are all subconscious. He's reacting to try to hit it harder, which kind of is generated from the stack system. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I believe so. Um, and, and it's... Mm -hmm. It's no different. Like, and then, so towards the end of that summer, he felt like when he was hitting the bomb, it wasn't really the bomb because it didn't feel like, you know, those were the, he didn't have the same feels. Um, and, and that makes sense. It's, it's no different than any other golfer, you know, maybe probably below a 10 handicap where you're like, okay, um, I'm hitting a fade. I want to hit a draw. So you got this feeling and no matter what you do, you can only get a two yard draw. Well, a month later, you're hitting big hooks. You're like, <laughs> Right. what's going on because you it, it feels the same to you but you now you're overdoing it right um so it, it, th those feels can, can can certainly change you're not even aware uh that you may be swinging it um differently um or that you've now gone beyond what that adaptation or the correction was supposed to be so um you know the feels are really important but you can't yeah. always necessarily trust them and certainly the whole point, you know, a big point of the stack training is getting that number on the radar that's saying, hey, I'm swinging faster. And you just kind of subconsciously uh, start to adapt. Right. I, you know, it's like you dump water on your chin and the next time you you put it in your mouth because you're like, I don't want to dump the glass of water on my chin. But you're not really aware of, oh, I you know, have a little bit more shoulder flexion and a little bit more supination. Right. You just kind of like, yeah, this worked out better. Yep. You know, what's interesting with Matt, you can also see that the backswing is picked up. The pacing of his backswing is faster. It's like Bryson when he went down this training as well. I probably got more DMs and comments sent my way on that alone yeah. than anything else. It's like, Travis, he looks like he's taking it back faster to me. Can you explain to the audience how that works? And was, was that something that you told him to do or did he just subconsciously start doing that? Well, he, you know, um, it, it may be a case of maybe folks not following him closely enough because he's all he's always had one of the faster like w his tempo was off the charts um, even two years ago, um, crazy fast. Uh, you know, him there might be a tie between him and John Rahm for um, shortest backswing time. Um, it may have gotten a little faster. Um, I'm not sure, but the advantage there is an inherent advantage if you can use it to having a fast backswing so um we want our muscles to do as much work on the downswing as possible get and, and change the energy of the club you know get get that work done on the muscles out to the club and that depends on the force the muscles are applying at, at the top of the swing if you're like uh hideki matsuyama or let's even take a bomber like cameron young who comes to essentially a complete pause well the, the force in those muscles is practically zero, just enough to hold his posture. Um, so then as he starts down, Cameron Young has to work really hard um, with a lot more effort than to turn those muscles on, fire them up, 
And certainly for a portion of that downswing, they're going to be working at lower force level, which means they're doing less work, which means there's mm -hmm. less potential to club at speed. Now, he's an amazing example because he's still swinging it with, you know, 184 ball speed, but he's probably got 200 in the tank. Not saying he should change. <laughs> but for someone who's looking to find speed wherever they can, um, then having a fast backswing allows those muscles to be producing a higher level of force as soon as they start down, right? So those muscles are firing hard to stop the body in the backswing. And if, if it's a quick transition, that means that they're already working at a high level uh, for the first part of the downswing that's going to add more energy into the system. And, and Matt is super comfortable whipping that club back. So, um, yeah, he he's, he's, you know, he's, um, he's maybe even ramped up the backswing speed a bit to take more advantage of that. I think he has. Uh, yeah. Concept. I think yeah. he has. It looks just more, um, gosh, what's the brisk, you know, to me in, in the backswing. He's a little bigger and filled out. So it just maybe there's other things happening there. Before I get to the stack system and this over, speed, under speed type of training. Um, the one thing that's fascinating to me, and I just did this video on it that I'm going to, it's going to come out later on. I took a swing back in 2019 of Matthew and then a swing from 2000 last year. Um, and you can see a dramatic difference in the club head is definitely more inside and the club shaft is definitely more down the line versus the club head, how he used to have it in front of him. And then it would almost, it would get a little laid off at the top. A little, it would kind of fall almost like, um, like Ricky would. Right. But, but short, a little shorter backswing and a bit more laid off. Now the club head has, it's not too far inside, but it's definitely more inside than it was. And the shaft Sasha is, is not laid off. I mean, it was pointing damn near parallel to the target line. I mean, you can see the difference. I'll send it to you. Is that just something that, just happened as well through this and it's like hey we're okay with it the club's fine you're picking up speed you're still accurate off we go yeah i, I um uh you know that might be something you have to ask matt um to be yeah. honest um uh we've um i mean the stats have just been training up so to me unless there's something broken with the ball flight <laughs> right um <laughs> You know, and he's able to hit some very different trajectories, you know. Yeah. So to, to me, uh, ball speed's high, control's great. Can you hit different windows? Yes. Then, hey, yeah. um, you know, whatever. Uh, so I would argue the club at the top looks better now than it did before. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it looks it looks better at the top. I mean, it's a little more inside, which, all right, no problem. And, but the club looks, it's not laid off. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And yep. so it looks more complete, looks longer, looks, you know, he's definitely turned more. Um, and now he's got that speed to work with uh, on the way down. The last thing I'll say about that faster backswing, um, it feels like that's something I talk to my students about. It feels like the, the higher skill player certainly would have more success with it. You know, when you get the yeah. higher handicaps that are trying to do that, you know, that the, you know, things can kind of blow up on a little bit quick, a little bit uh, more quickly than maybe the, the more skilled player who has a better swing shape and transition and those kinds of things that can lean the shaft. And so uh, that, that, that quicker backswing though, I think is something that we're going to see more and more. In fact, I'm, I'm surprised that more players haven't kind of went down this path a little bit more like Matthew has through this type of speed training um, that I want to talk to you about next, which is the stack system. So this system, you sent this to me, um, probably a year ago. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's, there, there's a lot to this system. I know we could probably talk for probably a couple hours on this, but in a nutshell, if you could, my audience talk about what this is all about and what the goal is for a player who's listening to this, like, Hey, I want to, I want to get a little more speed. What can I expect? investing in the stack system yeah so the, the primary objective is to increase uh, your driver speed by increasing your maximum speed potential not the speed that you'll take to the course um, so if you can swing it at 110 miles an hour right now and you're playing at 105 maybe you stay at 105 your max goes up to 115 or 120 but now you're swinging at a much lower percentage of your max and you're finding a lot more fairways or 
both go up, which would be which would be great, and that would be the case with uh, with, with Matt. Um, so we want to increase your driver speed. Um, we do it through um, overload and, and over speed training. Um, so a lot of research has gone into this. Um, uh, I partnered with Marty Jertson at, at Ping. He's a VP of innovation. Um, so basically I said, hey, here, here's what we need in the club. Can you design a club to do this? So we've got a hybrid length stick um, and we've got five weights that you can put on in different combinations. Um, and it's not random um, and it's not just about the weight. What we really want to know is how much force and torque you're putting into the average driver swing. Okay, so we, we know what that is when you swing a driver. And then we want to hit certain percentages of those forces and torques to give you the appropriate overload stimulus. So I would do in my lab here, I would do um, inverse dynamics with driver, with the stack to figure out what these loads needed to be to target the correct percentages. On the other side of it, we also want to be able to do overspeed. So that's, can we hit certain percentages of swing speed relative to your driver? Um, so we have to be able to go uh, not just lighter and heavier, it's not just weight, but when we change these weights, we're changing the center of mass location, the balance point, uh, the moment of inertia, which is resistance to uh, rotational motion, um, and also the overall weight. So there's those three things in order to get appropriate overspeed and overload stimulus. So that's at the, the back end. And then um, we have people... We have an app which really makes the product mm -hmm. um, because I'm able to bake these programs into it. So you go into the app, you do an initial baseline test, and we get a force velocity profile for you. So, so we know where your limitations are in terms of increasing speed. We also do some single arm only swings because sometimes uh, one arm can be the limiting factor. But we know how fast you swing heavy stuff. We know how fast you swing light stuff relative to driver. And then we provide a rank ordered list of programs. Um, and so you'll be like, okay, the app recommends this program. Boom, I'm going to do this one. Um, and the first program will be very similar. The first session in each program will be very similar for everybody. But as soon as you complete that program, we now adjust the next program, the next session. Sorry, you complete the first session. We know how fast you swung certain weights, what the rest times were. That gets dynamically uh, adjusted for your next session and so on and so on. Um, we, we, uh, provide a rest timer in the app. Um, we tr keep track of your personal best so that, you know, you get a nice cheer for every weight. So for every swing, you could set a PB. And we also have a, a PB uh, that pops up if you've done it for the set. We also have this neat feature where you can see um, how you rank relative to the other 7,000 stack users in terms of a percentile. So great, you know, maybe you're internally motivated and you want to improve yourself, but maybe you're externally motivated and you're like, well, I'm a 45 year old male. How fast uh, is another 45-year-old male swinging the 195 gram? So you can just tap on the app and you can see what percentile you're in. Um, and then we do a progress check at the end, reassesses where you're at. We recommend um, a new program. If you take time away, so let's say you, you stop training, the app knows that you haven't been training in 10 days, the programming gets modified. Um, so we have a little bit longer rest, a little bit less volume to ease you back, back into the program. Um, so, you know, my, my philosophy um, really is that it's going to be, speed training needs to be like lasers. You know, 20 years ago, no one had a range finder um, out there in the course, but now most people can't play without them. It's just makes your game better. You use it all the time. Right. Um, if you're a half serious golfer, um, you should probably be doing some speed training uh, to make the most of your game. And it's a minimal investment, you know, 20 minutes, a couple times a week, we'll, we'll start to see, see gains. So, most people, they've got a, a gap of about 20 miles per hour. If you don't do any training and all you do is play golf and your club head speeds at 100 miles an hour, you have the potential to get to about 120. And it might take you five years to get there. You'll see some big jumps early on, but if you don't do anything, you're going to stay at uh, 100 miles an hour. Well, that's no good. So um, you can just, you know, use the stack at your leisure for different periods of times in the year to try and get you as close to 120 as you can. Maybe you get up to 112 and you decide, all right, I'm only going to speed train once every five days. I'm going to keep it there during the season. Maybe try to make another bump up. But it really changes uh, how people play golf. If you go to our uh, review page, we've got hundreds of people in their 60s and 70s saying that, you know, it's yeah. literally changed you know, they're, they're hitting par fives in their home course. They haven't hit in 10 years. Um, so it just makes golf more fun. Yep. Yeah. 
You know, it's interesting. I, I've said this many times you know, on, on the podcast and other platforms that I, I spend more time lengthening swings out than I do shortening them up. You know, I mean, people are coming and, and, and but yet the perception, I think, is so much the other way, right? Like I overswing and the, you're probably shortening swings up all the time. I'm like, actually, no, I'm lengthening more out. People get older. They, they, they're not moving as, as dynamically. I'm trying to get them to move and lengthen things out and give them some energy um, and how to recruit and do that more technically where this, when, you know, cause I've done some of this and when you, when you do this and you t and you put it in their hands and they start going through this stuff, they start recruiting and swinging based off of the speed and you got to keep them within context. I mean, you don't want them like, you know, pull, you know, pulling off the ball completely so much and, you know, try to keep them in the realm of a golf swing. But when you just kind of let them go and, and react to this system, things kind of lengthen out nicely, you know, and you start breaking through that internal governor, Sasha, as I call it, that yeah. governor is strong, especially yeah. as you get older, it's strong. And, yeah. you know, and we just feel like the swing just keeps getting condensed and condensed and condensed and condensed. And pretty soon we got like an old man swing. I can't, I'm not even, I'm not even turning. Yeah. <laughs> so true. How many yeah. times have you seen that? How many times you've heard that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I play uh, my my local course. Uh, it's got about 650 members. Our first holes, 310 yards. There's a bunker. You need to be two, 220 to carry it. And there's maybe 20 guys at the club that can carry it. You know, we're at sea level. It's cold. There's always a little bit of wind in your face. But, you know, the, the guys that I play with that have been using this, so I get to see the personal um, interaction. Now carrying that bunker, it's like, you know, yeah. and these are guys in their, you know, late 50s, early 60s. That's the, the yeah. group that I play with. Um, and it's, yeah, they're freed up a little bit more. It, it, when when all you do is go play around the golf, um, you don't practice, or maybe even you're practicing, you're worried about where the ball's going. You're right. You just get more and more constrained. Mm -hmm. um, people never usually free up. But the, you do a bit of stack training kind of gives you that freedom to, to explore what it feels like to actually move the club fast. And then with that new speed, then you can make a little bit of a calibration to, to figure out where the face is pointing. Right. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, I, I love this kind of training. I just, I wish selfishly we would have had more of this when I was younger. I can, I think back to when I was playing a lot and I, I was just so concerned about, you know, like keeping it tight and three quarters and, you know, like turn my upper, not my lower and all this kind of stuff, you know, like more like compact was the word, I think that you would mm -hmm. hear a lot in um, together, and, you know, like very connected. Good, yeah. Good stuff. Accuracy wise. There, there's, there, there's some value. Don't get me wrong. Um, but never did I feel like I, I really address breaking through my governor and trying to maximize speed. Um, so it, it's fun now. And I would say, and I, and I hear this a lot with the speed training that I do with some students, they hit, they're hitting the ball further now at 55 than they did when they were 25. Um, and, and their swings longer and their bigger turns, extension in the spine and change in knee flex and all this, all these things start happening. And they're like, damn, that looks good. You know, I don't think I've ever seen the, I don't think I've ever seen the club right there before, you know, damn near parallel at the top. So yeah, there's a lot of people listening right now thinking I've lost distance. I don't, I don't practice much. Um, yeah. My swing's getting shorter. I need to lengthen out. And this is a, a really good way of, uh, of doing that now this is full swing but before i let you go i know this i know the stack system has something with putting coming out here shortly tell us about that yeah i'm super excited about it um uh we, we've got a, a, a the stack putting um mode in the app that's going to be coming out shortly it's going to be free to uh to stack users um and it's awesome i've been using it um the past few weeks um it's a um Basically, you, you'll go into the app, um, tap, I want to do some putting. You just need to find a green with any amount of slope, and we guide you through 18 holes. Um, it's all hands-free. You have the phone in the pocket. Um, it'll tell you, go find a putt that's, uh, you know, hole one, six feet uphill left to right. So you go over some, some spot in the practice green, find that putt. Um, you have a really easy audible command, whether you miss the putt left, right, short, um, what happened on the second putt? It keeps track of your strokes gained, uh, tells you what your strokes gained is going through these holes. Um, 
and we've got some really cool uh, statistical uh, features where you can, at the start of the session, tag if you're going to try a new technique. So, hey, for this button session, I'm going to try left hand low. You can do a bunch of sessions left hand low, then maybe you try a different technique. And in the app, you can do with the click of a button a statistical comparison. So you can check, you can look at it for putters, technique, a ball, speeds, you name it. Um, so a lot of people, you know, guess it comes to mind like uh, Shoffley when he's switched to uh, left hand low for a while. Maybe they did some extreme stats, maybe not, but an app like this would be uh, yeah. perfectly suited. So it's going to tell you, hey, for these three sessions, your strokes gain putting was 1.2. For these three sessions with this other technique, it was, you know, 0.45. So, you know, don't switch. And it's actually a, a statistics that are running in the background, inferential statistics, so you can be confident in the result. Anyway, so, it's a pretty, pretty neat feature. And it's not, you're using your own putter, right? It's, there's no stack putter. You're using your nope. own putter. No, you use your own putter, your own ball. You just need a green with a little bit of slope. Um, and you can manually enter, but I rip around the green. Um, we have an express mode, too, where you just tell the, the app how many putts uh, you've taken per hole. But it keeps track of your strokes gain. I, you know, most people don't, aren't aware of their biases. They, you go out and you do this round, you're like, hey, did you miss more putts uh, short or long? You know, were they missing more left or right? And the app, you know, summarizes that for you. It's, it's pretty slick. And that's good. I, yeah. The last thing I'll say, uh, Travis, is I'm a firm believer that the number one thing that pretty much every golfer, even tour players, amateurs, can do to improve their putting is to see more different putts in practice. So if you had 10 minutes and you could see 20 different putts in that 10 minutes, you're going to do much better in, in improving your putting than if you spent 10 minutes hitting the same eight footer. So this app forces you to, to look at all the different putts and it's weighted so that the putt lengths that show the biggest difference in putting performance between players. So if you're a really good putter and I'm a really bad putter, it's because of these certain putt lengths mm -hmm. and the app forces you to hit putts from those lengths. Right. So it's changing based off your performance. Yeah. And the statistics we have on why is someone on the PGA Tour ranked one in strokes game putting and someone's ranked 200th? We know, thanks to Mark Brody, yep. um, what putt difference distances are accounting for that difference in, in putting performance. So there's no three-footers um, because that doesn't account for any difference. There's no 50-footers because that doesn't account for the difference. But there's a ton of, of those putt lengths that, that really make up uh, the differences in performance. Well, we know Fitzpatrick can putt, too. He's uh, He's got yeah. that down. He's pretty much got all 14 clubs down. Now he's... Now he's got another 12 to 15 yards of length and all that. You know, it's fast. I'm just thinking with putting, you know, I always think back to when I got in the business 23 years ago versus where we are now as a teacher, as a, a student and a player of the game and all that. And it's like, we just talked about the full swing and lengthening things out and more speed. And then in putting, like we know most of these guys, well, they, they take it back further than they go through. And the pace of the putter head has some little quicker pace going back, you know, and it's a shorter finish. So it's like, there's just so many similarities even in there and just how far things have come, you know, really in the last, I mean, just 10 years, really. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, well, we've got, um, I, I've had your tool for a while and, and have used it. And um, we're going to, I just got into the affiliate program. So we're going to make this available as part of the Stripe Show podcast. And of course, the promo code for everybody is, is anytime we do something like this is Stripe Show, two words, capital S for both. So Stripe Show, you can you can plug it in. It's going to come out on my website, travisfoltongolf.com. We will send it out. And then you can go and get 20% off this system, the stack system. As we're into the summer right now, a lot of good golf ahead. Let's get rolling. Let's move the needle and increase uh, that club head speed because every... Still there? Just lost you for a split second. Oh, because every, yeah, every every gain in club head speed, one mile per hour is what, roughly distance-wise? Uh, two and a half yards for a tour player. Yeah. Yeah. So you pick up three, you pick up three miles an hour. It's like you just lengthen out a little bit, three miles an hour, and uh, there you go. You could have yourself seven, eight, nine yards, just like that. I'll finish with a quick story here. I had a guy. Older gentleman, 70 years old, loved golf, played golf like four times a week, took a lot of lessons. I got out to Jack's golf. He started really working with me. And, and, and I think all we really worked on for like a year, 30 minutes a day or 30 minutes a week, 
every other week. We'd miss a week here and there. I just continued to try to lengthen him out, and we would do some speed tra- training stuff. His downswing was good. He had good club face awareness. And, and we actually came up with this system, Sasha, where I said, look, here's let's call the number one swing just your stock swing. You're standing on number two T. Just give me that swing. We're going to call that your number one swing. And I said, okay, now number two, now I'm going to get in your head. The number two swing is my swing. I want you to try to do everything the same, but I want you to try to hit it twice as hard, roughly. Just hit it hard, twice as hard as you just did. And I know you're not going to hit it twice as hard, but reach back and, okay, so I was the number two swing. I said, now number three swing, you are out of control. Okay. You know, like you're not going to fall down, but you're, you are, I don't know where this ball is going to go. I have no idea where it's going to go. That's your number three swing. And at first he thought I was crazy and he would come back and eventually look at me one day. He says, you know, I actually hit the ball better with my number two swing. You know, when I'm trying to hit it twice as hard. Number three, I hit a lot of good drives, but I, I can't quite get that to the course. Yeah. My number two swing. I, Yeah. I, I feel like I'm just kind of being instinctive and letting it go and reaching back and here we go. And so it was kind of interesting, just this gentleman who was, you know, kind of going this way, condensing, we just length, 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 length it out. And we kind of one, two, three, and that's the swing that he would take. And number two eventually became his go-to and, and he was easily 10 to 15 yards longer off the tee. So it was kind of it was kind of fun just to go about it that way. And I'm telling you, we changed very little technically. I mean, just to your point, you weren't really getting in there and said, hey, turn your right hip like this, you know, your knee. It was a lot of just this be instinctive training, showing him the speed more and more. And all of a sudden, you know, he was 10 to 15 longer. So it's doable. It's not too late. The stack system, check it out. Use the promo code Stripe Show. Dr. Sasha McKenzie, I can't thank you enough, man, for coming back on. Awesome. Have a good day, Travis. Thanks for having me on. You bet.